Good morning, how's everybody? Awesome. Um, as she said, this is Donna, my name's Kevin. Uh, we are from Southeast Management Company. We're based out of Columbia, South Carolina. We actually work out of Bluffton, South Carolina, which is about as close to Georgia as you can get without actually being there. Um, we've been facility managers. Uh, she joined in 2013, I joined in 2015. And for the past uh, three years we've been, or four years, we've been uh, working together uh, at a facility. So we know all the aspects of management, maintenance, marketing, advertising, personnel, auctions. Uh, we also do some traveling for Southeast management for store acquisitions, training new managers, firing old managers, um, doing the auctions for those facilities and trying to bring them under the envelope of uh, Southeast management. Um, what we're gonna talk about today or what they asked us to talk about today is facility maintenance and facility safety, not just for you, but also for your tenants and how those two are interconnected and also the marketability of those aspects uh, to help improve your site, not just in the site of your investors and your owners, but also to the general public that could actually generate rentals. Um, also after this, they'd have that new uh, overtime with the experts thing in Andros A, which is just down the hall to the right. Um, pretty close to the lavatories, which is pretty handy for us. Um, so please join us after the show. And if you have any questions, we only have about 45, 50 minutes, so we're not gonna be able to cover absolutely everything, but um, we'll cover most of it. We had to cherry pick a few things, and uh, we can pick up after that. When I first started with the company, um, one of the first things they had me do was go out and secret shop all of our competitors. And what they wanted me to do is get an understanding of what the competitors were doing in relation to what we were going to be doing on our facility. The previous managers had let things go. They had let things slide. Things were not up to the standard that we were hoping for. And so one of the first things I did was create a game plan. I created what we called our 30, 60, 90 day plan. And this helped identify items that we could take care of right away within those first 30 days, things that would take a little bit longer, 60 days and 90 days. I also created what I called my wish list, those things that you look at your facility and you think, oh my gosh, I really wish we could do, or I really wish we could offer. One of mine, for example, was to convert a building over to climate control that was a standard building. Big wish list, you have to dream big. But what that 30, 60, 90 day plan gave us was a focus. The owners, the managers were all on the same page as to what needed to be done, how fast we could get it done, and then for the big projects, what we needed to work on budget wise. We created this to be able to get a fresh set of eyes on the facility. Fresh set of eyes, we invited friends, family members, to come by, look at the facility from a customer's point of view. We also incorporated that information into that game plan so that we could create schedules, checklists, things that we needed to be able to focus on moving forward as to how we were gonna get the facility to the standard that we wanted. With those fresh set of eyes, um, you know, she said, you know, we asked uh, some friends and neighbors to come by and pretend like they were moving in and play with everything. Use the doors, use the push carts. Let us know which carts had a wheel with the mind of their own, kind of like at every other shopping center you go to. Uh, make sure the lights came on. If you have the motion sensors, you're gonna have some dark areas in the hallways. You might have to put another sensor up there. And they do get dirty. If they're dirty, they're not gonna work, so um, make sure that uh, stuff works like that. Everything we have at our facility is on the ground floor, but we've been to some of the facilities where they have two floors, even five or six floors, and those railings can get a little shaky, and there's one of those heart-stopping moments when you're going up the stairs with a box in your hand and the railing feels like it's gonna give way, especially when you're four stories up. Um, making sure the railings are tight, making sure the stairs are well marked. Elevators are a whole other story. Uh, I've seen some beat up elevators at some of the other facilities just from use. Push cart goes in with a piano on it. I'm not going to tell you who's going to fare better. It's probably going to be the piano. And especially if you have one of those older freight elevators like you see in the old horror movies, kind of with the gates that roll up, those things have to be maintained. Have them checked out more than they should be. We had one in one facility that uh, 
someone actually hurt themselves pretty badly trying to shut the gate properly between floors when it came open after it caught on that. Your cameras and security systems and your gates, um, how many of you know how to adjust your gate tension? Do you have the little chop gates? You, you know, you know, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, that's an easy fix. Rather than having the guy drive an hour and charge you for his time from coming from Brunswick, Georgia to Bluffton to do this, and then drive back to Brunswick and charge you $120, he can show you how to do that, and most times they're happy to, because when you have to call them at four <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday and interrupt their football game, especially if Georgia's playing, um, they're very happy to say, okay. Uh, they're, they're very happy to show you how to do stuff. Um, your doors and latches, one of the checklists that Donna was talking about is we have a, a post move out checklist that we just go by real quick, make sure the walls are, aren't deaded, make sure the weather strip works. The door probably takes up a majority of my time when I'm doing that inspection. I just make sure it stays up on its own and doesn't slowly creep down so when I turn around and go to walk out, I get cracked in the forehead. Also the latches, those handles can come loose and they can cut your finger. I've cut all of my fingers pretty heavily the first couple weeks I was there because I didn't know what I was doing. Fire prevention and alert systems. The fire marshal that we have in Bluffton is very, very strict, uh, but he's fair. What he likes is when the inspector comes through or the, the uh, fire extinguisher company comes through, my apologies, is that when he's done with that inspection, that tag is hanging in front of the fire extinguisher, not tucked in behind it, so we can walk by and see it right through the case. Also, those, uh, those covers on those can get cracked really, really easy from someone walking by, especially the outside ones. And they're not that expensive, so if you can talk to your uh, fire extinguisher guy, he can probably get you a box for close to nothing. I think there's like six or seven in a box. Just waiting for the noise. There's no noise like the slide projector in high school. Um, Signage for wet floors. We have rainy seasons like you would not believe in um, South Carolina. We also call it the low country because that's what it is. Um, I do not have enough wet floor signs to do the job to cover every single, like when you walk into a hotel and they have the tile floors, they got wet signs everywhere around the pool area. I don't have enough of those. I have two, maybe three for when I'm mopping uh, a building out. So we printed up our own and we put them in the windows for the exterior doors leading to interior hallways. We have painted floors so they get really, really slick. If someone walks in a few times with wet shoes or wet feet, it's gonna get dangerous and you could have a slip and fall hazard. Um, and when you're painting, you know, have barricades, caution tape, just to keep people from you know, running into your office and yelling at you because they leaned up somewhere that they shouldn't have. Um, anybody know what a lockout tag is? For electrical panels, good, cool. Um, for those of you that don't, it's a little device that goes on a breaker switch, so when you flip it off, no one can just walk up and turn it on while you're replacing a light fixture and send you flying across the room. Um, ours fortunately have locks on the panel, but we still printed up some lockout tags for that panel, put magnetic tape on the back, red and white stripes on the top and bottom from clip art, just said caution, do not engage panel, electrical work in process, slap that on the breaker box. That's a little warning of uh, someone who thinks they know more than you. Oh, the lights aren't working. Now they are, and now you're not. It's happened. Um, safety cones, those orange ones, in case you're gonna be crawling around on a rooftop or trimming branches or cleaning gutters, put those out there to make sure that no one's you know, walking underneath from their unit and gets showered with damp, wet, yucky leaves from your blower. That was not fun. Another thing that we've created is we have a section now for our weather-related supplies. I know most of you have all different weather issues. Some of you deal with hurricanes like we do. Some of you deal with tornadoes. Some of you deal with snow and ice. Well, I'll give you an example. In January of 2018, the South Carolina Low Country had a snow and ice storm. One of the things that we know is that Home Depot and Lowe's and Ace Hardware do not stock ice melt in our area. So we spent two days with metal shovels chopping ice because it didn't get cold, warm enough for the ice to melt. So 
after we went and exhausted all of our options with water softener salt and pool water salt, we ended up having to be out there chopping ice. So after the snowstorm, one of the first things we did was order ice melt. Not something that we may need to ever use again in South Carolina, but we have it just in case. Other weather-related supplies, sandbags. If you get a lot of rain like we do, sometimes things can start to flood. So we have sandbags in our maintenance shop. Extra mop heads, extra buckets, extra mops themselves, batteries, generators, anything that we need for weather-related situations during cleanup, during preparation, and especially when we get back because anytime we have a hurricane evacuation, it's pretty much guaranteed there's gonna be a mess when we get back. We also had to look at any of our ramps, our stairs, our curbs, our sidewalks, anything that might be uneven, anything that needed to be identified as a trip or fall hazard. None of those things were marked when we first got there. None of those things were identified. And so we spent a lot of time looking at those things and identifying those things. And so we would encourage you, when you're at your facility and you're doing your new walkthrough with a fresh set of eyes, look at those things. Because you never know when someone can find the one thing that you missed and end up getting hurt. How many on-site managers are, are here? OK. Cool. Wow, there's more than I thought. And owners, operators, that's the rest of you? How many new people do you need in the industry? OK. Here's the big one. How many know first aid, basic first aid? How about CPR? Outstanding. Um, our clientele in Bluffton, we are we're like this far away from Sun City Hill Pet. So we have a demographic that is not quite past retirement. Well, okay, they're past retirement. Um, and there, are, there have been instances when someone is working alone and they shouldn't have been, they've overexerted themselves, and 911 had to be called, not at our facility, but another facility. And it was a good thing that that person knew what they knew as far as first aid and CPR until 911 arrived. Rather than standing over them thinking, what do I do? You can actually be a help, and that would be a big safety step. Um, Open line of communication to the office doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be there all the time, but uh, we found it handy at some facilities. They had the office hours and the phone number not just posted on the office, but inside the buildings at strategic places, light switches, fire extinguishers, wherever you would go in case something happened. Usually on the inside of the, uh, the exterior door would be a sticker. And if you have an after hours phone, put that number on there too. Obviously, intercoms are the big one, but I think those are slowly going the way of the dodo because of smartphones. You got four year olds with iPads, you really don't need an intercom system. When it comes to a repair, um, contractors, yes or no. Um, we all have that one tenant that has the beefed up truck with all the tools and the arc welder and the little anvil, you know, glued to his or bolted to his, uh, his bumper. I'm not that guy. I'm not sure if I want to be that guy. That's a lot of responsibility with all those tools. We do have the tools necessary to do most of the jobs on site within our skill set, but we do have to call for help. Um, outside of what our skill set is, there is training available for us in the industry through HVAC, electrical, um, and we can get certificates to do the heavy duty stuff, but that would be an added expense and also an added liability. Your prior work experience, you may have a gentleman that works for you, maybe your maintenance guy who used to do HVAC or used to do electrical. Not saying he can't do it physically and mentally, but it's questionable whether he should just because of your insurance level on this guy. He may be classified as an office worker or just a, a certain type of labor. If something happens to him, he hurts himself really badly, or there's a, uh, how do they put it, a rapid unscheduled disassembly of what he's working on. Um, that may become an issue and uh, that may be a very, very large expense down the road. And um, I think that's why I started leading into the level of insurance. Um, I'm not supposed to be walking on rooftops. I'm classified as an office worker. But when I do that, I really have to be careful, and I do have other people that help us do it. So while I'm up there, I'm kind of classified as landscaper. 
Another thing to think about when you're at your facility, once you are looking at your own skill sets and the skill sets of your coworkers, then you need to ask yourself, if this is out of my capability, I need to get a contractor. And so <laughs> we inherited, um, how shall I say, some contractors that we didn't necessarily trust what they were telling us, and some contractors that I think were enjoying charging us for a lot of service calls when they really didn't fix things. And so we went through some trial and error to find really good contractors, electricians, plumbers, gate companies, fire extinguisher service companies, all of the day-to-day -day operations that are above my skill set. I tell folks all the time that Kevin can do everything that I can do, but I can't do everything that Kevin can do, and neither one of us can do a lot of things that we look at and go, nope, I don't have a clue how to do that, and I could get killed doing it, so let me hire a professional. The other thing that we discovered when we got to our facility was that previous managers were not working with companies that were licensed, bonded, and insured, which creates some problems and some liability issues. So as we were searching for vendors and creating our vendor list of folks that we would use, we got copies of business licenses, copies of their insurance, copies of, if they were doing work on the facility, we had them send us a certificate of insurance that listed our facility as additionally insured so that we, the facility itself was covered under their liability. So when they did work on the facility, we knew that they were covered. Nothing will ruin your day more than when you call a contractor that you find out mess something up and they tell you, oh, well, that's not my problem, I'm not insured. So I can't encourage you guys enough to make sure that any of the outside contractors you work with have those things. Keep them up to date on your calendar, on your schedules. If you have repair work set up, you can actually put into your schedule programs a checklist there that yes, you have all the necessary records and information before they actually start work. One of the things we've said a lot over the years is if, if the bid seems too good to be true, it probably is. And so when you're getting bids from contractors, we encourage you to get at least three. If you can come up with the scope of work, if you know specifically what needs to be done, have them bidding on the same work. That way you're getting a competitive bid that will work across each vendor. I know that sometimes when we were looking for new landscapers, we had prices come in anywhere from $450 a month to $1,300 a month. And that was because each vendor was gonna quote on different services that they offered as part of our bid. And so we created a standard scope of work. And so when we sent that out, we said, everyone bid on this. Anything above that, please have it separated out so we could see what the additional costs would be. I know technology is a weird thing to bring into site, uh, site maintenance and safety, but oddly enough, it does, does work. Um, we've used it in the restaurant business for uh, many, many years, and I found it was, it was really handy to have uh, for a maintenance tool. Uh, the electronic calendars that y'all have on, y'all, um, on your email or on your, your uh, point of sale software, if those can be logged into from other sites, even remotely, from other stores, from other managers, from your district, your regional, your owners, they'll know the progress of your projects on site rather than them having to call you every day going, so how's the project in Building 5 going? They can look and they, they can see what's going on. It's also handy for scheduling. They might be able to pull a manager in from another site to help you out if the case may be. Um, tablets for photos and documentation, I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably doing this already, but I wanted to put it in there just in case. Uh, email yourself those pictures, just to keep yourself up to date, and you can email it to everybody uh, within your company, your district, your regionals, your owners, again, your investors. Um, and if you're having a problem, God bless you, uh, if you're having a problem, you can email it to another manager, maybe they can help you out, maybe they have some experience trying to figure out the same thing you did a year earlier and can work with you when that one. Um, prepaid phones, we use those for after hours phones, but they're also handy for us on property. 
um, just for you know, communication purposes and again for the taking pictures of uh, projects that we're doing and any improvements. We found that we can put those on social media and keep our tenants informed and they appreciate that. Two-way radios, you know, I'm sure everyone has probably a two-way radio set at their facility. Uh, I found that they're much cheaper than dropping your smartphone off a two-story building. Uh, two-way radio will survive, smartphone not so much. And also you don't have to take your gloves off to use it. One touch, very, very handy. Security and lighting. Um, how many of you were at the seminar yesterday for the digital marketing with automated? Okay, you, you'll remember this. Uh, they talked, and, and you will. Um, they talked about how lighting a facility was a big sales point for a lot of the websites, and that was for a security reason. He talked about women going to facility late at night or by themselves, and they felt more comfortable with a well-lit facility. I'm not saying it has to look like a prison during a jailbreak, but doesn't, shouldn't look like an abandoned warehouse. It should be lit enough so that you can see what you're doing and what's going on around you. The solar and the LED lights, that's just um, for an accent or an up lighting. I actually have about 20 of those on the property that help to up light the front of the facility so people can see what's going on as they drive past the facility. No one can hide anywhere. And they do stay on quite, quite some time. Some of them stay on for eight or nine hours. And we also have a few that actually work as accent lighting on the buildings. Um, remote control drones and cameras. I know it sounds like science fiction, but um, they use them a lot in building inspections. You can also use them on your property. Um, there are some facilities, I don't remember the name, but there are, I think they're in North and South Carolina now that are completely unmanned. There's nobody on site. Everything's done by kiosk. They have a vending machine for the locks and the tapes and the boxes, whatever, and they had what they loosely referred to as a Roomba with an iPad. It's this little robot with a stick and an iPad on it, and they would bring that out of a closet, and they would roam the hallways at night to see if anyone moved out, and if anyone had a problem, they could hit the button, the Roomba would come out, you could FaceTime with somebody. They could access that from their office, from another facility, um, from Cancun, from wherever they were. How many of you have a gate control system that will show you a gate log of who's coming in and out? How many of you have looked at it on a regular basis? All right. You'd be surprised how many managers never look at them. One of the things that we found is that by checking that information every single morning, we could see who was coming and going at our facility. We offer 24-7 access. And so people can come and go and get to their stuff whenever they need it but it creates an issue where if you're not paying attention to what's going on, you can have delinquent customers trying to come in after hours. We caught someone using their friend's code to come in and out because we can match up the gate log to what's going on on our cameras. The gate log also is a big help for folks that are trying to just enter random codes to see if they can get in your gate because some of our competitors don't offer 24-7 access, they will have folks try to come and break into facilities just by driving up to the keypad and just punching in random codes to see what they can get to open. We also looked at our camera systems. Better cameras, zoom capability, night vision, cameras that can pan, cameras that are motion activated that will follow a motion through your facility can do wonders to try to increase your site safety. I know that most of you probably have a monitor in the office where you can see what's going on behind you or what's going on around your facility while you're in the office, but a lot of times those cameras can get bent a little bit, they can get knocked around a little bit. We had a raccoon come off of a building, land on our camera, knock it face down into the ground, run off. Well, we come in the next morning, we're going, okay, why is it showing the driveway? Why isn't it showing the buildings? So those cameras can be a great way to monitor what's going on at your facility. And also, if you have blind spots, that's a perfect opportunity to see if you need to shift those cameras around a little bit and move them to an area that can give you better visibility. 
We talked about intercom systems for site safety. A lot of folks nowadays, you're glued to your cell phones. They'll just call the office from wherever they are. Our facility is laid out in two different phases. And so we have eight buildings on one side, four buildings on the other side, plus the RV lot, which is way in the back. And most of our customers, they're not going to get in their car and drive over to the office with a question. They'll just pick up the phone and call us. And so we mentioned about having our phone number posted, not just your office phone number, but your emergency after hours phone number. Most of the customers, at least our customers, respect that it's an emergency phone, but you might get those few <laughs> random calls that people just don't pay attention to the fact that what they're calling about may or may not be an emergency. Having those numbers posted gives them a peace of mind that they can get a hold of someone if they need them. I'm laughing about the, the emergency phone because someone called from Indiana to ask if it was raining in South Carolina. <laughs> that was their emergency. <laughs> they were coming for vacation. They wanted mm -hmm. to know. We know you're not open on Sunday, but we had a question. Thank you. The after hours <laughs> phone also helps alert us to problems that may be taking place. Uh, for example, one of our customers called, they were in a building that the AC had failed on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, yeah. And so we were off, we weren't on, on the property, but we were able to call someone, get someone out there. We went to the facility to meet the tech and we had it taken care of within an hour. And so those are the types of things that your emergency phone can help with. And tenants, for the most part, like to be able to keep you informed. We have enlisted them as extra sets of eyes and ears for our facility. Oh, absolutely. Um, reducing risk exposure. Uh, this is for your tenants' peace of mind and also for yours. Um, I know nowadays a lot of stuff is stored electronically, strictly on computers, and you have the e-sign with the tablets. We don't. We, <laughs> we have stuff on paper first, and then it goes to computer, and we have backups, mostly because in case our computers fail, we have all that information, even though it does get backed up uh, on a daily basis and um, on, on a monthly basis, it gets a full you know, redo. Some of that inf information can get corrupted and can get lost. There will be blank spaces here and there, even on you know, the most advanced uh, backup systems. But if you do have paper copies, lockable file cabinets are a big thing, we keep them locked. Um, we had some facilities that did not have lockable file cabinets and stuff was just laying around all over the place. It was not a very uh, safe environment for customer information. Um, computers, password protected, obviously. I'm sure everybody here does that. Um, if you have any shortcuts for uh, purchasing things, marketing, merchandising, things like that, the longer the password, the better because if anyone gets a hold of that stuff, they can be ordering stuff on your dime. Authorized access for your gate codes. Um, probably have those few tenants like landscapers and contractors that have multiple employees and every now and then they will have to let an employee go or they will fall out of favor. Is that me? Mm -mm. No? Okay, someone's popcorn is done. Um, so they will have to change that code every now and then. and. People, one thing that drives us crazy is when people hand out their code and their key to a friend, mm -hmm. and that friend shows up and is driving around the property trying to look for their unit because they don't understand where the unit is, and we have to go out there and start questioning them, why do you have so-and-so's code and key when you're, they were not authorized access? We have three spots on the customer registration form for authorized access, and if their name isn't on it, we call the police. Been very close to arresting people for showing up using someone else's code and key because this it's private property and it's a secured facility and hopefully your tenants will appreciate that. To avoid people guessing like Donna was talking about earlier, this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, four digit code, 10,000 combinations. Won't take you too long to just randomly do stuff. I mean 10,000 I'm sure. Um, but by adding two digits, you can increase that to one million combinations. We can have up to nine numbers for a combination. Not many people can remember nine numbers, but some people will have bigger brains than others. So 
the more numbers you add, the harder it's going to be for someone to try to figure out that code. Um, emotional safety, it's in quotes for a reason because it's kind of a weird thing. Um, also mentioned yesterday that some people who have storage units aren't there by their own choice. Lost their job, lost their home to a fire or a disaster, um, were forced out through a difficult relationship or a bad relationship. Maybe they're running away from somebody. Now they have all their stuff in their truck and they're upset and they just want to hide it and hide themselves. Um, they need to know that they can trust us with their privacy as well as their information, but also their location. We had a um, lady at another facility, and not ours, but another facility, showed up, bad relationship, put her stuff away, put everything in there, said, don't tell anybody I'm here. Ex-husband called up, claiming to be her cousin, saying that, oh yeah, you know, she's got a unit, but I lost the key. Guy let her in cut the lock, took all their stuff, lost everything. So keep their information secret. That's the emotional safety thing. Risk exposure for us, obviously. Alarms, panic buttons. How many of you have a panic button in the office? OK, those of you that don't, think about it. Think about getting one. <laughs> Uh, I've been to some places that don't have one that should, and I've been to places that do have one that you probably don't need it because you've got full exposure. You're not there after dark. You're not there till, um, you know, 7 o'clock at night by yourself. Um, but if she's going to be in the office until 7 o'clock at night by herself in the winter when it's dark, if there's not a panic button, I'm getting her a concealed weapons permit. Lighting in the walkways. Um, motion, motion lights, anybody have motion lights in places? Okay, not just the, like, like outside on your walkways by the off, okay, cool. That's a nice hint. If you're not paying attention, that light comes on, you know someone's walking up to the office and you can, that's why we stand to greet when people walk in because we don't know what they have back here. They might have a concealed weapons permit. Um, exposure to yourself, obviously PPEs, that's old abbreviation, personal protective equipment. This is pretty much a no-brainer, and all of it's available at you know, Lowe's and Home Depot. It's not expensive, and it's a lot cheaper than a trip to the emergency room. Um, the non-slip work boots, how many of you? Okay, yeah, metal rooftops with moisture. That's another heart-stopping moment is when your footing comes out from underneath you and you're two stories up. That's why I wear mine all the time. Because with these hallways, who knows? Being in touch, police department, chamber of commerce, um, how many of you have Nixle on your phones, N-I-X-L-E? Okay, um, that is a alert system, text-based alert system. Your local authorities will send you a text. If there's a traffic accident, if there's been a shooting, if there's been um, any, a gas leak somewhere, your local authorities will send you a text. You can share that with your, your tenants as well. It was very handy during Hurricanes Irma, Matthew, Michael, um, the ice storm, we were putting stuff all over social media. People were calling from Indiana and Ohio going, you have snow? Like, yes, we have snow. Also, other uh, facilities can keep you up to date. If there's someone shady at their facility, they'll let you know. Um, backup and remote access. Be sure it's okay with your boss. Um, we had um, a gentleman in North Carolina who was not too keen on his employees having access to their point of sale system, which I understand. It's customer information. You don't want it floating out there. Um, we were only able to get limited access to our point of sale during evacuation, so in case someone called and had a question, we knew who they were, what unit they were in, and what their contact information was. We couldn't take payments or anything, but we had contact information for them. Excuse me. <clears throat> Red Book is kind of like our self-storage for dummies book. Um, most of our facilities in Southeast Management, if you walked into our store from another facility, you would know exactly what to do in case of an emergency. All of the contact information for our electrician, our plumber, um, our landscaper, our AV guy in case the camera shorts out. Um, we had information in there for the bank. 
credit card information for our processing company out on uh, the West Coast. Wait, we are on the West Coast. Um, time change is really messing with me here. Um, but all that stuff was in that red book, basically an operations manual, but it was specific to that site. It wasn't just how to do self-storage, but how to do self-storage at this location. Keeping cash secured is, probably is again, another no-brainer. If you have a safe, obviously use it. Um, or deposit it daily. We don't deal a whole lot with cash. Uh, we're mostly electronic check, mail check, or a credit card or automatic <coughs> payment, but when we do get cash, it's pretty substantial, so we try to get that into the bank as soon as possible. And I know it sounds a little cliche to change your route so no one knows what you're doing. In big cities, it could be an issue. Property in Washington, D.C., it was an issue. She had an armed guard, and I uh, was thankful for him on mm -hmm. that one. Marketing and communications. One of the things that we have really embraced at our facility, as we've been making improvements to the site, as we've created our checklists and we're checking things off, that we're getting things done, and we know that we're following our daily, weekly, monthly checklists, so we know the tasks are getting completed, then we had to kind of pivot a little bit and figure out how do we then communicate everything that we're doing to our tenants, to the public, and making sure that everybody was on the same page so they could get excited about the changes we were making. One of the first things we started doing was taking before and after pictures. You would be surprised if you go back and you start looking at those pictures to see where you've come from and where you are now. It really is a motivation factor for us to be able to see what we've been able to accomplish. Marketing also to the public, we sent out press releases to the local newspapers. They are always looking for news. They are always looking for things that they can share with the public. So if we added a new feature, a new benefit, uh, converted a building, you know, expanded something, added RV parking, expanded our wine cellar, any of those types of things, we sent out a press release. Get the word out there publicly. It doesn't cost you anything. The local paper might only put a little bit of news in a business brief. But you would be surprised how many people pay attention to those things. We use social media. We had a Facebook page that we were very active with. We posted things on a regular basis, including our before and after pictures, so the public could see what we were doing. We went and we met face-to-face -face with apartment communities, retirement homes, went with the managers of the uh, retirement center so they could, as they were talking to their prospective new customers, they could say to them, well, as grandma and grandpa are downsizing, you can use the storage facility to be able to store their stuff while you go through the sorting process. We met face-to-face -face with builders and realtors and home renovation companies to let them know about the changes that we were making. We created how-to videos and we posted them online. Uh, you'd be surprised how many folks don't know how much stuff you can actually get in a storage <laughs> unit and they can't visualize it. Well, if you have a creative side, get out your phones, shoot some videos of great storage units within your site and how much stuff you can get into them. Host an event. We had a community events that we did on site. We had back to school supply drives, canned food drives. We did register to wins where we had folks that would come in from the general public to come in and win, register to win for a raffle item that we were giving away. Might be something simple, might be a gift basket or something, but getting people to come to your site, little or no cost to you, but it gets the public interested in what you're doing. We also made sure that we did a blog, and the blog was not necessarily about storage, but it was about things that were going on in Bluffton. We're right next to Hilton Head. If you've ever been to Hilton Head, you know it's a resort. People from all over the country come and vacation there. Beach, golf, for those of you who are golf fans, the PGA will be there the week of Easter. And people want to know what's going on. And so we wanted to become an, a location and a source of information about the events that were taking place. Top of mind awareness for us helped us get customers coming in to rent storage units 
because they heard about the fact that we talked about Taste of Bluffton, or we talked about the Seafood Festival, or we talked about the Arts Festival. Because we were mentioning those events, those events community organizers would post on their page a thank you to us because we had helped promote their event. So their followers got involved and saw that we were involved in what was going on in the community. Most of the things that we did didn't cost us a penny. It was just the time of the manager to put in and do the work. We also made sure as part of our marketing efforts to communicate with our tenants. The tenants can be your best source of marketing. And once again, that doesn't cost you very much. We sent out email blasts. Now we used Constant Contact. They have monthly uh, charges based on the number of contacts in your list. And so we had an email list just for chamber members. We had an email list just for realtors and builders and home remodelers. We had an email list just for current customers and one for past customers. So we would send out email blasts with special offers to our past customers to come back and store with us again. We would send email blasts to current customers to tell them about our upcoming events if we were having our back to school supply drive. About two weeks ahead of time, they got an email inviting them to come and participate and help the local kids in our community. Didn't cost us a lot of money, helped generate community goodwill, and we had a lot of fun doing it. We used our email blasts to create quarterly newsletters. We used those newsletters to be able to share with them upcoming repair projects, if we were repaving the main entrance, when the entrance would be closed, construction schedules, things like of that nature. When we put the new cooling system in the wine cellar, all of the wine customers had a heads up when it would start, when the temporary unit would be installed, when the permanent unit would be installed, so they knew that we were taking care of their belongings. If we didn't mention we also have a wine cellar. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also had remote access to our emails so that we could log in and check on evenings, weekends when we, the office wasn't open, also when we had to evacuate for hurricanes so we could communicate back with our tenants. One of the things that we did more than, that I think had more response than anything else, during natural disasters, we sent out a list of the important contact information, websites, texts, things like that, from South Carolina Emergency Management, the local sheriff's office, the local hurricanes uh, emergency center. So we were sending out reliable information to our tenants. And one of the things that they appreciated more than anything was the fact that we were communicating that information. A lot of our customers don't live there full time. And so they were seeing all of these horrific images of what was going on in our area. And they kept emailing us and Facebook messaging us and sending us emails, oh my god, what's happened at the facility? And so by staying in contact with them, we sent out information in the morning. We sent it out again afternoon. We sent updates throughout the day, and the tenants loved it. Yes, I will tell you managers, it can be a lot of work. But the response that we got back is an example of a review from Google My Business that we got. And this is just one of many that we received because of our communication skills with our tenants. You got about 40. 45 after uh, the hurricane evacuation. And that's in addition to the number of emails that we had, the calls that we received, the appreciation from our customers because we stayed in touch and we communicated every step of the way what was going on. And whether you're working with site safety, whether you're working with repairs going on at the facility, whether you're working on things that you're adding, expanding, changing, you would be surprised how many managers, and I hope none of you are like this, you'd be surprised how many managers never tell their customers anything that's going on. They don't stay in touch with them, they don't call them, they don't email them, they don't post anything on social media, and so the customers have no idea what you're doing. 
that was one thing that we took as a, a huge effort on our part because the previous managers never did it. If a customer drove out to the facility and there was road maintenance going on and they couldn't get to their storage unit, eh, let the customer get upset. That was never acceptable to us. And so we took the stand of, we're going to communicate with our customers to the best of our ability. And I don't think in the five years that I have been there, a single customer has come in and said, I'm moving out because you, you tell me too much stuff. <laughs> and so we would encourage all of you to you know, come up with those game plans. If you have questions about how to do it, we'll certainly more than welcome to share any information on the step-by-steps of what we did. Because communication for us, especially about things that were going on in our local area, our environment, natural disaster issues, any of those types of things, we wanted to make sure we were in the forefront of telling our customers what was going on. One, I think one of the big reasons we did that is, is from, from our past of, you know, I was in the restaurant business for 30 years, so it was all about the customer, all about the customer, all about the customer. The customer's not always right, but the customer is still the customer. And she was in it from a customer service point of view from property management. It's all about the people that are coming to see you. And we are responsible for the belongings of 600 people and to let them know that they can trust us with what's going on at the facility, not just with the facility, but with their stuff. They felt a lot better bringing their stuff to us, and they would tell their friends, and their friends would bring their stuff to us, not to competitor A or competitor B or competitor C. They would bring it to us, and that felt really good when people would come in and say, hey, we'd like a unit because so-and-so said you guys are really great at what you do, and that was awesome. It's a great feeling when that happens. Um, I know a lot of what we said is probably repetition for a good deal of you. I hope that you've taken something away from this. Donna, I want to thank you very, very much for having us. We are nervous, as you can possibly imagine up here. This is our first time doing it. Um, thanks again to Melissa and Amy from ISS Magazine. We will be down in Andros A uh, with an oxygen tank. And <laughs> um, thank you guys so much. This has really been a blast. We appreciate it. Can I take a picture of everybody before I go, or before you go? Don't get up. I'm, ta I'm talking to you. Don't get up. All right, just, just real quick. I'm going to... Okay, on three. Hi, Mom. One, two, three. Thank you. I appreciate it. She, she didn't believe I was coming to Vegas. <laughs> Thank you all again so much.